Colin Jost came in, obviously, and did that fun, uh, sure. you know, and so him and Scarlett had never worked on screen together before. So that was funny and fun. Yeah. Whose suggestion was that Scarlett's suggestion? No, or it was not. Oh, my God. Her? Hello, Blenders, and welcome. Welcome to episode number 314 of Real Blend, a podcast that asks every single week, are you not entertained? Oh. On this week's show... Gladiator 2 has a trailer. I've been telling you guys about that footage ever since I saw it at CinemaCon. And now you finally know what I'm talking about. It looks pretty sick. Uh, Fly Me to the Moon hits theaters and director Greg Berlanti is going to join the show to talk about working with Channing Tatum, Scarlett Johansson, and all of those moon landing conspiracies. My name is Sean O'Connell, the managing editor at Cinema Blend and a co-host of the Real Blend podcast, joined each week by at least one of the guys... <laughs> This week, it happens to be Jake Hamilton of Fox 32 in Chicago. And in addition, Gabe Kovach is sitting in the chair. Hello, boys. Hello. Oh, man. Good to see you, buddy. I, I was yeah. joking earlier. We're the Blues Brothers, for those of you watching us on, on yeah. YouTube today. Well, we're going to tease the YouTube channel in a hot second. But yeah, it's good to see everybody. We got to talk about Gabe's hair. Uh, Gabe's hair is magnificent. It, it's just... <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's yeah. like a, a long, flowing, luscious river of chocolate pouring from when his scalp. You when you ride the motorcycle, Gabe, do you uh -huh. go helmetless so that the locks flow? Uh, I don't. It's legal in my state, too, which I think is <gasps> silly. Uh, I don't. I wear a helmet because that's what you should do. But it's long right. enough that it that it flies out the back of the helmet, which probably yeah. looks good. The benefit, the benefit of that is that Gabe gets to do like the ham the helmet pull off where like the yeah. hair <laughs> flows in the wind when he pulls his helmet off. What's wild is unintentionally i do it in slow motion every time <laughs> <Good>. yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Every, everyone around you is going like any like come on dude like, let's go like, <laughs> just wild to be on a podcast with someone who has won the best hair award twice not once but twice and it's and, and not it's, gay. It's not gay. <laughs> it's the guy with the shortest hair right now. i chopped off not all my gay. hair so he did yeah. he did you really did you weren't really sure with it um later on jake maybe if you have if we have the time in the show i want you to talk about driving the pace car too yeah the, oh, yeah should be fun nascar race because yeah. that was really sick yeah but in the, we got a lot of other stuff to get to in terms of the show hello everybody thank you for joining us we're really glad to have you back with us for another episode if you're watching us on youtube thank you for joining us hit like and subscribe uh tell a friend about the show we're continuing to add subscribers on a regular basis we're at youtube.com backslash real blend podcast this week for premium subscribers is a newsletter uh so i'll have that into your inbox by friday morning and if you want to learn how to join real blend premium check the description for information on how you can sign up for it uh greg berlanti is a guy who's been around for a really long time known primarily i know greg from his cw work with mm -hmm. um the Arrowverse and and all of the shows that he's. Um, in fact, I'm wearing my Green Lantern ring as a. God, you're such a nerd. He, oh, dude, you have no idea. My kids are so embarrassed. I wear this around <laughs> the house every once in a while, and you so wear the other that ring around the house. For those of you who yes. can't who can't see, Gay or yeah, Sean has a, a Green Lantern a Green ring. Lantern ring that came in the mail the other day. Um, Why I, did it come in the mail the other day? Because I ordered it. <laughs> because I because I paid for it and they sent it to me. It's amazing how the how the mail works. Um, the yesterday. So long story short, we had some visitors the past couple of days and they had a big dog uh, who stayed with us and so they have left. And Michelle, the first thing she did when she got home was like scrub the house. Like could not wait to just like get to the floors and 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 wash as much as she could and then she put socks on me so that i could walk around and like help dry the floors but the socks didn't fit me fully they were like half hanging off my feet um so i had those on i was wearing a superman t-shirt and i had my green lantern ring on and brendan came in the front door and i happened to be standing right there and he just looked me up and down and he goes dude <laughs> he, he was just like, hey and just remind him it's all hereditary I, that's what I said. I said, you're looking at your future, baby. Yeah. Enjoy it. <laughs> we, we also uh, fail, fail to mention um, yeah. another person oh. or another person who's, who's mentioning or who's joining the show today, because uh, if you can't tell, I'm actually in studio right now and I just shot a commercial, shot a promo um, for a uh, animal shelter fundraiser that I'm doing a little bit later this month because I do all the animal shelter fundraisers here in Chicago, which means okay. that <gasps> the, un the unofficial mascot of real Look blend her. there she is she's, sweet girl i'm i'm 90 sure she just ate a bug how often do you bring her to work 
They bought once a month. She loves, she, if, if we ever, if I'm walking around Chicago and we get in the vicinity of my building, she will yeah. actively try to pull me here <laughs> because she loves coming in so much because she gets all the, she truly is her father's dog. She loves all the attention that yeah. she gets and she loves a room full of people that love her just like me. Yeah, um, is, so in fact, this, we're, uh, we're, I'm in sort of Jake. one of the side breakout rooms right now and it's driving her crazy because everyone keeps walking by like trying to like trying to play with her and she can't play with them. So she's hating oh. life right now because I'm keeping her. She's like Hannibal Lecter on, on, on the wrong side of the glass. <laughs> I would love if you just let her loose and she wouldn't interrupt it live TV right now. She has. She, had a lot, she came in studio two weeks ago and just straight up like went and like That's hung a out pretty with great, a neurologist. It's a pretty great way to, you know, interrupt the news. Yeah, hey, I have exactly. a cute dog here. Yeah, exactly. But this is what I was gonna—I was gonna more say. I'm and I'm sorry to get to distract from Greg Vellante, who's gonna be our guest and is an amazing <laughs> I'm so, I'm guest. So sorry. But you were—you uh, sent a picture in your Instagram, and you were like behind the camera kind of thing, and like panning the newsroom, and then you showed Daenerys laying mm -hmm. on the ground, and I thought like. How does she not walk into shots? Like I would assume she's that she really, she's really chill. I mean, also you have to keep in mind she grew up in in a newsroom, so she's sure. used to to all of this. As long as she can kind of keep an eye, she's the kind of dog where like she just needs to know where dad is. As long yeah, as she yeah. can keep an eye on me, as long as she knows where I'm at, she's fine. Sean, she also knows how to break a story. She, she does. Grew up in a newsroom. <laughs> she does. <laughs> if it bleeds, it leads. She's always, she's always telling me this. She's got, a little, she's got a little notebook and pen and paper. <laughs> <laughs> All right, listen, Greg Berlanti, <laughs> in the meantime, has a new movie coming Greg's out listening called to the show Fly right now, Me going to the Moon. Yeah, exactly. Uh, sorry, Greg, we're getting to it. Um, Greg's movie, Fly Me to the Moon, is uh, from Sony Pictures, and they were nice enough to get Greg to come on the show. It is a uh, a, a moon landing uh, story. It's a it's a bit of a romantic comedy. As somebody pointed out, uh, David Poland, who, who um, covers some stuff from the trades, he this is like the only uh, like adult comedy, mature comedy that's hitting theaters uh, during the summertime, which is a kind of insane uh, and hopefully works in the film's favor um, because it's, you know, giving grownups uh, who are looking for a date night an option uh, to go to that isn't Despicable Me or something like that. Uh, and so we had the pr uh, privilege of sitting down with Greg to talk about his work on Fly Me to the Moon and working with his his leads and and getting this film through the production cycle. So let's throw it to Greg Berlanti, director of Fly Me to the Moon here on the Real Blend podcast. So congratulations on the movie. Um, and I'm really got, glad I got a chance to check it out beforehand. The quote in it um, that stands with me, and I think it's one that's sort of stuck with me for a really long time, is Kennedy's quote, we choose to go to the moon uh, in this decade not because uh, they are easy, but because they are hard. And um, it resonates, you know, a ton with with why we do a lot of the work that we do. I'm curious how that applies to filmmaking. Can you tell me something that uh, about directing and the filmmaking process that probably a lot of people think is easy, but is actually much harder than they anticipate? I think any storytelling is is you're creating uh, I think it was Picasso who said art's like a lie like life, you know, like and I think storytelling mm -hmm. is to me, it's like you're you're making something and it, it just so happens the narrative of this film is sort of about what's fake and what's real and, you know, why what is what's important. And but but in any storytelling film or TV show I've ever done, I think to to create something that feels truthful, I think. And obviously, everybody's very aware these days of all the pressures economically and by studios and whatever, but you have to sort of start from that place of wanting, I think, to do something authentic and truthful, whatever genre it may be in. And, and you know, it's kind of throughout the director or the showrunner's job in TV, you know, to, I think, be the arbiter of that and protect that thing throughout the process at script stage and production and post and when you're getting a bunch of notes so that the audience, because I, I think audiences are really smart. And they watch mm. something and you can hype something to the cows come home beforehand. They can hear something's great, but then they, you know, and not everything's for everybody, but in general, like, you know, something feels something that feels true. Like it, it gets through, it gets through the muck. Yeah. And so I think that's the, probably the hardest thing. And also part of what I, I enjoy the most about it, but but it's it's definitely one of the more challenging things. And I think the audience on the, on the B side of that, the audience is really grateful for it. Because they feel like they got something that like, oh, that that felt I felt like it came from that place. 
which is why I think like word of mouth press is so much stronger than, you know, and, and why we shouldn't be placing such an emphasis on an opening weekend, because it's it's really when people connect with a project and then they go tell other people to go see it that, that I find gives a project. Absolutely. Lights. I mean, how many shows are in your queue right now that people have told you, oh, that's great or that's great or that's great. And, you know, this yeah. hit. I've worked in network television for many years and it hit network television first, you know, where everyone suddenly was writing off the, like people were like writing things off after the first weekend, something aired. And, you know, sometimes in this day and age, it can take a TV show a year to catch on sure, and it has to yeah. you know be here and then be on Netflix or be here and then be on Hulu. And then suddenly people sort of start to talk about it because there is so much for all of us to do and watch and and obviously there's digital there's social media now and there's so many things competing and when you make a show or a movie now when i grew up you couldn't watch every single movie of all time you <laughs> know like it yeah. wasn't you know it was just vhs was just coming along so now you know you're competing against not just every show today and movie today you're competing against every piece of art ever that's ever existed <laughs> so it takes a while and you know you really rely i think on the audience and the patience of the studio folks or network folks to say, we're going to stick with something, you know, like we're going to, we really believe in this thing and we're going to let yeah. it catch on. Greg, my wife and I watched the bear a month ago. Right. It's, there you go. Like that was it. There yeah, you go. That, I was like, why did we wait so long I, for this? You know, sometimes <laughs> that has that impact on me too, where it's like, if everyone's talking about something, like I have to wait a minute. Cause I can't, I don't want to be in the melee. Other yeah. times I'm ahead of the curve and I'm like, ooh, you get to be one of those people who's saying like, you really need to watch X, you know? So, yeah. Well, the, one of the other takeaways from your film is um, it made me think and rethink about how projects are sold uh, yes. and, and spun to the audiences. Yes. And I'm curious, just you personally, how much interest you take in the marketing of your projects? Are, is this something you're involved in from, from the first step? I used to, I used to really not be involved because I used to think, well, I don't know anything about this stuff, you know, like, and now I've realized it's, to me, it's even more and more important. And, and, but I still always approach it the same way, which is I just, I'm an audience member, you know, that's kind of how I approach making the movie too. I just think of myself, if I were sitting in the audience every day, as I'm working on every aspect of it and script and production design and acting and performance and editing, everything is just for me all about the audience. And so the mar marketing is is a version of that too, which is if I were an audience mm -hmm. member, what would make me want to see this film or hear about it? You know, I, I chose to, one of the biggest reasons I wanted to make this movie was when Scarlett and her team and her producers sent me the script, um, you know, I couldn't believe that someone of her caliber w and, and Apple at the time and now Apple and Sony were going to get behind in such a big way an original story. And I mm -hmm. knew as an audience member, I wanted to go see, I, yeah, everybody's clamoring for more original. When I was, again, when I was growing up every weekend, you were going to sit down at the movie theater. You didn't know what was going to happen. You know, you sure. just, you didn't, and, and always surprised. And I think to be a part of a original adult, yes, it's rom-com, but yes, it's got some dramatic moments. You know, it was a blend of tones it, 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 that it had all of those things and that she uh, was so supportive of it and, and choosing mm -hmm. as her, a producer and her first big movie to produce to actually say, I want to do something original for the audience in this day and age where you keep hearing about how hard it is to sell those things, to go back to your marketing sure. point. So, you know, yeah. it's going to be challenging. I, I tend to be drawn to things that are a lot of times because they are a blend of emotions and they are, you know, they're not so easy to put in one box or another and, and people sure. have to kind of, you know, you might describe the movie you saw it's totally differently from the way I would describe it, you know, and right, and that right, that's right. part of what excites me about it. And but it does make it more challenging, but it's always rewarding on the other side of all of it. So I'm starting to see at least it, from the outside, it looks like a trend and maybe you see a little bit differently. Um, more of a push towards the stars whose names are above the title m mattering more. You know, it feels like. With something like the Fall Guy, with something like people going to fly me to the moon, you know they're seeing Scarlett and Channing, or they're seeing Ryan and Emily, and, right. and that's pushing more audiences forward. Do you see that as well too? Uh, yeah, I definitely think every place right now is, you know, uh, probably has less money. I mean, everyone's doing more for less, and so yeah. uh, and so you know you're relying on what is what are the ways that are you know going to help get people realize that something's an event that they need to leave their house for or sure to the point of a tv show you know what's something that makes someone have to stop 
everything else they're doing and watch that, you know, that night, you know, uh, yeah. and, and so it's, it's an urgency, I think, you know, like, oh, but you know, it's, it's, I don't think it's been, un- certainly hasn't been underreported that there's less and less stars for some reason at that same caliber, whether it's our familiarity with everyone now because of social media or how accessible so many people are. But I, I do think one of the exciting things about this film, it just for me as a filmmaker was, oh my gosh, I'm going to work today and I get to work with Woody Harrelson. Oh my gosh, I get to work with Channing. I get to work with Scarlett. I get to work with Ray Romano or Jim Rash. Like yeah. there was, it, it felt like an event for me just to go to work. And so I'm hopeful <laughs> that that means that like, oh wow, that's going to feel like, you know, uh, an event for the audience where that the, the allows the movie to go to all those places because you want to spend time with each of those people. And, and yeah. they do, they are large. There's, there is something true about stardom and that star power. And I've worked with enough people across the years that have been moved back and forth between TV and film. And they're, they're almost even different kinds of stars. And there's a wattage that these two in particular, but the others in the movie too have around them that I think you just know kind of when you're in the presence of somebody who's like that iconic and whether it's uh, uh we, we we bring that to it already or whether they yeah. just exude something i i definitely know when i'm in that that presence all right so for me kind of uh, selfishly i get to go to the savannah film festival every year yes and so i jolted up in my seat when i recognized downtown savannah yes, yeah yep uh we decorated for yeah, it yep. yeah can you tell me about the process of of converting that downtown area like right by leopold's ice cream it looked exactly That's right. out of the out of the 60s. Yeah, so I mean it was Leopold's helped and then uh, and that movie theater, old movie theater, the the, the I think it's the Savannah School of the Arts uh that's right behind yeah. there. Yeah, that corner was I when I came upon it and and when we were when we were prepping. So I had spent some time in Savannah as a child. I had an uncle that lived there and I went there for a month in one summer and I remember feeling like it was from decades before. I remember some of those streets and some of those. So when they mentioned that we'd get, you know, on this film, even though it all takes place in July, 1969 at Cape Kennedy, we only had about five, six days to shoot at Cape Kennedy. And we had about five, six days to shoot in Savannah. So, so, and the rest was in Atlanta in the winter. And so I knew like, and I didn't, I wanted the audience to feel like, oh, I'm in the summertime in Florida with the Florida lighting. So each one of those days was so jam packed. And each day in Savannah, the pier we shot there, you know, the Tybee Pier, and we turned that mm-hmm. into the Canaveral Pier, and that was a blast. And, and um, you know, I also feel like for a period film, there's something to the wardrobe and the look and the, that's the sets. When you walk onto them, if you're not transformed on the day, if we don't, if the actors yeah. don't show up and feel like they're stepping back in time, you know... It, it, and then the audience isn't going to feel like that. And so, sure. and so um, you, you really want to pick and choose and isolate, like, where are you going to do that? So you can really throw all your money at it that you may have. And, 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 and that was just fun for me. You know, I, I, I was, I was born in 72. And so there were things that were a lot of things in, in when I was a kid and six and seven years old that were still around that were from the late sixties you know, dressers and artifacts and cars and, and things. So it really brought me weirdly back to my own early childhood um, yeah. and, and what it was like sort of in that, in that time. And it was, um, we had the same thing at Cape Kennedy, you know, NASA was so participatory, which people may not think about a movie about faking the moon landing, but they were <laughs> right on board the movie from the very start. And they, they got that we were really also celebrating what happened and, and, you know, so much of, Sadly, I think so much of some of what was achieved with the Apollo mission was lost to time to the fact that people can just that there's enough of a, a percentage of people that can just render it as a conspiracy theory now. And and sure. part of that is is reminding them, no, 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 we did this <laughs> and this is what happened. And, you yeah. know, and, and so pouring the right amount of time and money into recreating the firing room or going to shoot at Kennedy and to to really we were shooting like TV level days, like six, seven pages a day at Kennedy because right. I knew it would be so valuable for the audience to be in the real VAB and to be yeah. like where they assembled the rockets and to be really on the launch pad and to really be at these places that where things really happened. Well, I'll give you a little peek behind the curtain. My co-star Jake and I saw it at the exact same time. We both came out of it and said to each other, like, was that real? Like, did, is this kind of how it happened? <laughs> so you really walk a great line between... <laughs> You know, yes, this feels like 
this couldn't have happened this way, right. but, but maybe it did. Right. So if that's no, what yeah, you're aiming for, you hit well, it. Thank you very much. I, I mean, obviously that's the, the sticky wicket with the film in that, like, I think, look, there'd be a lot of folks who could say, oh, aren't you just endorsing a whole conspiracy theory by whatever. But I, I, I really feel like we had to go there to show why the truth is important. And mm-hmm. and so without actually examining how did they really pull it off and how would they have done this if how did they really do it as a NASA individuals that the 500,000 people that worked on the program and then how did how if someone were to fake it at that time technically yeah. how would it have been done and 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 so we did a lot of research on how it could have been a fraud, but 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 just so that we could show the audience ultimately without giving away the ending, you know, or or the third act, which is all about was it faked or not, really, um, yeah. you know, um, um, hopefully to walk away with a reverence that we have for what was accomplished. There were there were a few individuals that were there then because it was true they were so young. There were so many twenty three and twenty four year olds working for the Apollo program, it's kind of incredible. It's another reason why I keep saying to young people today, like that's why young people should go see this to see what young people in 69 accomplished. It's yeah. pretty amazing. And so um, there were a few of them that were there then. And when they walked into the firing room, uh, the, which is, you know, usually when there's these Apollo movies, they all take place in the Houston portion, which is after the rocket right. is launched. So right. it always goes to Houston, but the firing room where they could, where they would launch the rockets and then all grab their, snatch their binoculars as quickly as possible because their job was done and Houston took over and sw- yeah. and turn and watch the rocket going off. We, we simulated down to a T all the visuals that were in that, in that room so that the room really, and we put it on shakers so that the room shook. So the, all the, all the extras, everybody felt like what it was like to be at a rocket launch in that, which you can do when you go to Cape Kennedy now, they have a smaller version of it when you go down there. And I encourage oh, cool. people to go and visit because it's just, it's, it's, again, you, I want, you want Americans, everyone all over the world to go back and be reminded of what was, what was done there. And so you knew if that yeah. part didn't feel real, by the time we got to the moon, it wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't matter if it felt real or, or fake. And then in terms of yeah. the faking the moonwalk stuff, we had, uh, you know, we, we actually, even though there's only five or six minutes of it in the movie, we simulated all two and a half hours of the moonwalk and shot all of it. And we had, Did you? yes. And so those are, those are, I cast stunt men to play the stunt, the fake stunt people. And they worked with the choreographer for weeks and okay. literally like we, uh, cause at some point I realized these guys aren't going to be able to just do that. Like we need a dancer teacher or someone to like move them <laughs> in exactly the way they would move. So that sure, when, yeah. and, and, and then we, we did so many studies on like moon dust so that when they stepped on the moon, the same dust would come up on the cameras that were coming up with. And then we, a lot of the shot stuff we shot were in, was in camera and we even lit it the way they would have lit the fake moon landing back then, which is just one giant Klieg light basically okay. that would okay. burn out regularly. <laughs> and like, you know, and, and it gets, it, you only know when you're using it, you only have a certain period of time before the bulb's going to go out. And so yeah. like, that was another thing you're like, well, how would they have done it if that was a problem back then? So yeah, it was, yeah. it was, it was, it was a, an adventure. So in doing this, you proved to yourself that they couldn't have faked it. I, I, you know, there's a great story that one of the men who worked on that program said to me, and, and I used to say it to everybody now because I feel like it's, it, more people should talk about it, but he said, you know, Greg, the Apollo program was however many billions of dollars back then. So it would be, you know half trillion now or whatever it would it'd be an insane mm-hmm. amount of money now but a majority of that or two-thirds of it was actually spent on the rocket <laughs> and like okay. no one doubts that the rocket went off because everybody was there to see it with their own eyes and so yeah the the miraculous thing that it was was it was twofold or threefold it was it was it was blasting off that rocket and and then yes sending the lem down to the moon and, and coming back but right, but, right. but the first leg, no one talks about being a conspiracy because everybody watched it go off. But that was a bulk of the money and a bulk of the science and a bulk of the time. So why would they right. doubt this portion? You know, yeah. and so I think that's <laughs> the I think that the thing that you you get when you work on it or are part of that or meet those individuals is they had already done something impossible five uh, fifteen 15 seconds in. You know, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and and right, and right, so right. and so to to conceive that the other stuff that we weren't there for 
you know, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I definitely, I don't have any doubts, but, uh, but I do think culturally there's a reason why people, there's just a, obviously we're in a moment where people trust the government less and you know, people want to, you know, people wonder. And that, that was the reason d'etre to make them film was to t- talk about why, you know, why the truth is matters and, and that you yeah. do it from the point of view of a woman like Scarlett's character, who's a con artist it's a, it becomes even more relevant, I think. Hey, what was the project that Woody wanted her to join him at at the end of the movie? Oh my gosh. I, oh, oh yeah. Oh, I, I thought you meant for real. I thought you meant like Scarlett and Woody had a secret project. No, 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 no. no. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I mean, we're I alluding to, we're obviously alluding uh, to, to, uh, you know, cover the cover up for the president, for the president, for Nixon at the oh, time. <laughs> everything that would have gotten her busted. So we had, we had, we had a few, uh, we had a few jokes about that. We just, we went with that one because it's a, l- a little bit more obscure. Is that going to be the sequel? Is that what you're planning? Oh, I don't know. I know, no. I I, uh, I I just hope this movie does well enough that uh, people <laughs> want to see more. I, I certainly wish I could spend more time with the characters. They were a lot of fun to, and the actors. They were, it was a real well, joy for me. Well, specifically, um, Jim, let's talk about Jim Rash, who's just a oh my genius. Gosh. Uh, and how much of, of, of he, was he a surrogate to you like arriving on that fake moon set and asking all those questions. Was that you essentially asking all those questions? Well, I think a lot of people that know me would probably say there's more similarities between his character and me than I'd like to admit. But there's like, (laughs) there's certain people that I've worked with in the, in the film and TV business that I was thinking of when we were working on that character. But Jim came in and just embodied him. So, you know, he was the first person I was auditioning for that. That part was the first role I was auditioning. I was getting, you know, Scarlett at the time, and she was also my lead producer, and she was the lead in the mm-hmm. movie. And so we were kind of getting to know each other, but it was like, oh, wow, we're going to agree on a lot of things because we r- both agreed immediately on Jim. Like, it was so obvious okay. that he had his own – part of the joy of the film is putting together all these different comedic abilities that, like, you know, how Ray Romano makes a joke versus how Jim does a joke versus how Scarlett or Channing do it versus Woody, you know. And so you had all that. Um, you know, different levity and different kinds of levity. There is yeah. a half hour, 40 minutes of Woody and, and Jim on the floor that I couldn't even use in the movie. Like the two of them <laughs> watching that moon walk together and like how, yeah. again, without giving too much away at the end, but just putting those yeah. two comedic elements, it was such a odd couple <laughs> and they were just so opposite, but they, uh, they had a lot of, they had a lot of fun. They even just saw the movie together for the first time and they ended up at the same screening city next to each other. So it's, it's, it was like, there was that kind of stuff, but Jim, Jim's a, you know, he's his own kind of genius. And I think what's great about him in this part is that if you know him from community, if you don't, you know, if you know him from, you know, his other work, uh, you know, yeah. he's, he's an Oscar winner, writer as well. I mean, he's so, yeah, he's yeah. so talented. So a, a lot of times your job in these things is if you cast the right people, just get it all, get it all on film. And then it really becomes sub- subtraction, sadly, about like, what am I taking away? You know? Yeah, um, sure. And so yeah. there's, there's some great stuff for us to release after the movie comes out with that was on the cutting room floor. I'm going to assume Victor Garber is another person who you just wish you had more time with. Yes. So Victor and I have worked together on a number of series through the years and Mm-hmm. He's maybe the nicest human on the planet. And so he <laughs> did me a favor. I was like, you know, there's the, we're in the middle of this movie and we need for some senators. We want some fun cameos. And uh, Colin Jost came in, obviously, and did that fun, uh, sure. you know. And so him and Scarlett had never worked on screen together before. So that was funny and fun. Yeah. Whose suggestion? Was that Scarlett's suggestion? No, or it was not. Oh, my her? God. That was me. I said, would was he it? ever do? Oh, yeah. That was totally me. In fact, she totally stayed out of that one. I just kept asking her producing partners who were terrific. And, uh, and, and, uh, I just kept saying, would Colin ever do anything? And then I he was down there a few times when we were shooting and I asked if he would, and he's another one where there's like, we had so much fun stuff on the floor. I just, I couldn't make that little moment go on forever and ever, but he's, (laughs) he's another one. He just, he had so many jokes, you know? And they like, again, when you get the right people, you really, you really just have to stay out of their way, I think, and and let them do their let them do their thing. Hundred percent. Um, the other important bit of casting uh, that it's, comes out throughout the, the movie is a black cat who has to keep showing up. Yes, yes. Which seems like it probably led to more headaches than you can imagine. Yeah, you know, I was so fearful about the cat, primarily because I am allergic to cats. <laughs> so like, okay. I can't even be in the same room as a cat without getting hives or not being able to breathe. So of course, I I realized like, oh, uh, and then you hear just. 
I never worked directly with the cat before, but you hear for years, they're so impossible to deal with. Yeah. So, <laughs> yes. so, so, and you, and just as a human being, you know, they're impossible to deal with. So I was like, how is yeah. this going to happen? But oh, again, one of the things we're most proud of, I think on the movie is that there's no CG cat in that film. Cause at the beginning, everyone was like, you're going to have to CG this cat here. You're going to have to CG him there. We, we yeah. had to, we shot him for real and we had to sometimes CG a few of those things like higher up because we didn't want to put him in peril or danger, obviously. But but it's three cats. They're all real. They're all shooting the same cat throughout the movie. He was mm. e very easy to direct. Did everything I asked. They all did each everything we asked. And it's a lot of fun in the film, obviously. All right. I'll get you out of here on this one. Um, what's something about the film that changed the most in your edit that maybe you didn't anticipate? That, uh, be, you know, you spend an extra amount of time on on a specific sequence or yeah. even a tonal uh, thing that you were reaching for. Like, what's the thing you've worked on the most that changed the most in editing? Uh, I would say, well, we cut a lot of time out. The original script, we had 30, 40 more minutes of this movie. And, and, and so each one of the uh, every time we were with an audience, I, we were learning more and more about what they didn't need to see. But I, I would okay. say the easiest thing was there was like a chunk of 10, 15 minutes at the beginning, more of story. And and mm -hmm. uh, it just, the movie begins when the two of them are, and not, not to say that the stuff before it isn't important, but like it really, really, when the two of them are on screen together, you know it's going to happen, you're waiting for it to happen. And so for me, it just became about how can we get to that moment as quickly as possible and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and so, uh, and the, uh, luckily so far the audience agrees. <laughs> I love finding out how, how a director figures out what that final cut's going to be. I know it's tough, you know, I, it's killing yeah, no, I, 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 I tend to, you know, I've never on any movie I've ever done, I've never had to do reshoots. So I always overshoot. I always have too much. And then I subtract even on our episodes of shows, like it's just about, I'd rather get too much and then just take away, take away, take away. And that's yeah, a easier, yeah. it's a more, it's just an, it, it means you have to kill your darlings, the old expression, but, but it's all sure. right. It's, it's fine to like, you know, to know that like you've got somewhere in the universe. And I think the audience, even though because those things were shot, the audience can tell, even if they don't see it, you can feel it. You can feel that part of the story that, that, that isn't there. And so um, I think sometimes it's really helpful to have that stuff. Absolutely. Greg, thanks for coming on the show, man. We really you appreciate the time. Thank you so much. We want to thank Greg Belanti and also our good friends at Sony Pictures for getting him on the show. The movie is called Fly Me to the Moon, and it comes out in theaters this week. Let's get to our review of the film, um, and we will keep this spoiler free. Uh, Jake, I don't know if you felt this way about it, but to me, um, there are two movies happening in Fly Me to the Moon, and I partially just wish it chose one of them mm -hmm. because I was way more interested in the story of nasa hires a marketing expert to shoot the fake moon landing mm -hmm. in case things don't work out right like that's not a bad backup plan mm -hmm. obviously during the space race you know no one really knew 100 percent whether things were going to go right or not it would have looked horrible for america to potentially lose on a big global stage like this as we were racing the russians and so bringing in someone like scarlett johansson's character in order to shoot all that and all of the stuff with Jim Rash, who I thought was incredibly Brilliant. funny. He's always, whatever project Jim Rash is in, he tends to be the highlight of that project. And I think this is, this is that as well. And I will say this because you always get to say Chicago guy, Jim Rash, Charlotte guy. Hey. There you go. North that. Carolina's own Jim Rash. Come on, who um, needs Harrison Ford when you got Jim Rash? <laughs> I thoroughly enjoyed those elements of the film. Um, and and I thoroughly enjoyed them more than the romance between Channing Tatum and, and sure. Scarlett Johansson, primarily because I, I didn't think they had a ton of chemistry. Sure. Uh, and I just don't know if the movie itself was as interested in that storyline. Like the other stuff felt more like it congealed a little bit better than than the romantic side of it. So I'm not saying that I had to like endure that part of it, but every time I shifted back over to the fake movie and, and shooting that stuff, I was way more engaged with the film. Uh, I would agree with you. I, I do think that the um, sort of moon landing, uh, maybe being fake conspiracy idea uh, was far more interesting than, than, but I, you know, to, but to your point, I also don't think like the, the rom-com element was, was too 
forced and, and maybe mm. you're right maybe maybe as they're writing the script they realize that they don't actually enjoy that part of it so it didn't feel like it was a massive part i actually do would say what well, it's 75 percent the film that you're saying that you like and only 25 percent maybe the the part about the relationship i sure. i think my biggest hurdle to get over was me trying to understand what the tone of the movie was and i guess and, and this is being said i actually really like the movie um, so, so, but I guess as I'm watching it, you know, there, there are no opening title cards sort of kind of put, you know, placing you in, in any particular point in history. There's mm -hmm. no indicator as to like, is this movie meant to be a joke? Is it meant to be tongue in, tongue in cheek? Are we supposed mm -hmm. to question like maybe or n whether or not this actually happened? So mm -hmm. I, I think I, I spent the first half of the movie just trying to grasp what type of movie it really wanted to be. And I'm still not entirely sure, sure I know. I don't know it's, if it's meant to be sort of a farce. I don't know if it's meant to really make us pause and question whether or not it happened. I don't know if it's meant to like really try to imply that because it seems incredibly plausible. That, that this happened like yeah. like like Woody Harrelson's character I feel like is kind of who is who plays sort of the the um, government official for Nixon who uh, it you know is is, is there who it, it really pushing for them to to make this fake moon landing video all of his points make a lot of logical sense yeah. like the the blow to you know especially coming off of of the Kennedy assassination everything that was happening in the 60s it's 1969 it's been a hell of a decade the blow to american morale if if something had gone wrong with that mission uh, he's absolutely right. Would have been devastating, and it would have been really hard to come back from. Yeah. Um, so I, I, there was a part of me that's also most like like I, I was watching this, going, "Are you trying to convince me that maybe this happened?" Because I'm kind of convinced at this point, not yeah, to sound like a conspiracy yeah. theorist. So yeah. I don't know what what sort of movie do you feel like it was trying to be? Well, the inclusion of Woody Harrelson's character leads me to believe that it's aiming for more intelligent farce because sure. he does he does that really well yes if you're gonna get he's, woody harrelson so, yeah 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 that's a great point that's a really great that, point that's who you put in that part yeah to a little bit you know wink to the camera yeah you know we're in on this joke kind of thing yeah. and we know but you're right everything that he talked about and all the stuff that they set up and even bringing in the jim rash character the the yeah. faux director yeah was very much like when this could have actually yeah, happened. Yeah. And, at, and so at one point, you know, I, I mentioned we're not going to bring up spoilers in this. It's not like you could spoil this movie necessarily, but like it's early on in the film where it's name dropped. It's like Stanley Kubrick gets name yes. dropped. Yeah. And he is it's notoriously. Oh, is it? Is it? Yes. Okay. Yeah. He notoriously is the director who has been linked the most to you know, the moon, moon yeah. landing conspiracy yeah. theories. And so, um, yeah, you know, I think tone is a big question with this film because I went back and rewatched the trailer for it just the other day, having seen this movie now a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And they play up on scenes that I kind of even forgot were in it, which is like Channing Tatum sort of racing to make sure that the moon landing stuff happens or that the, the NASA stuff happens. Sure. And there's like an explosion that sends him flying across the yeah. room. And it's it's kind of phys big physical comedy sort of yeah. thing. Um, whereas I think the the movie in its most compelling is when it's, you know, because it also wants to do earnest in a little mm -hmm. bit and and have us get behind the success of the sure. of the uh, Apollo 11 mission and, and understand so, why it was so important. I mean, like there are some pretty incredible mm -hmm. sequences um, within Mission Control in Houston that yeah. are really great. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, it's. You know, if you're using Apollo 13 as the bar, it's going to be t hard to, to ever top any kind of mission control scene out of Apollo 13. But yeah, I mean, there's some really great sequences that sort of reminded me of of an Apollo 13 sort of. I mean, the the detail to the sets and the costumes and everything. I mean, it's it's a far more serious sounds like the wrong word, but a far more like like legit movie than I, I agree with you. That, that I mean, that that opening joke about the explosion that sends Channing Tatum across the room like that's that's within yeah. the opening five minutes of the movie. Right. Uh, and that's that's not the tone of what this movie is. And there's also like a terrific montage about them trying to get funding from um, senators and congressmen. Yeah. yeah. That I thought was really effective because it reminded you how often this 
lunar program was on mm. the verge of collapse at, sure. you know, at almost any given time. So in general, I would recommend people go check this out, yeah. especially people who are looking around and are exhausted by sequels, you know, and and the the lack of options for original storytelling out there. I, I love Scarlett Johansson. I think she's terrific in this. I think, again, it's similar to like a Woody Harrelson um, when you cast her. She comes with some. She's able to bring the character's baggage mm. to light. Uh, there's there's some compelling things you're going to find out about the character yeah. as you go through it. She does a really great job of selling that and also hiding it for as long as she needs to. Woody Harrelson's terrific. Channing, I thought was fine. Um, yeah, and... the, the Channing part was supposed to be Chris Evans. God, that would have been so much better. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I mean, her and Evans have such a long history, yeah. not even like even before the MCU. Yeah. yeah. So what was, happened? Uh, Do you know I mean, what it was happened? just a scheduling thing. Well, because it was supposed to be Jason Bateman was supposed to be the director. Okay. And so it was going to be Jason Bateman directing Scarlett Johansson and Chris Evans. And then I think Bateman left over, uh, I think, what, what do they call it whenever they, they don't get along? With it? Like, um, Irreconcilable difference. Creative yeah, differences. Yeah, creative differences. Yeah. And then I, okay. think, I think that threw off the schedule, which then messed up with Chris Evans. Fascinating. All right. Yeah. No due respect to Channing Tatum, but this would have been a better Chris Evans vehicle. Yeah. Yeah. So, They're, interesting. <laughs> you, 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 and we, you and I both um, just spoke with uh, Scarlett and, and Channing the other day. And mm. they, I just, the reason I, th this is fresh in my mind, I just cut the interview today. And they, they said something in there that I feel like Kevin would have loved. Um, I, I asked them, the question was uh, about backup plans and what was, did they ever have a backup plan in their career in case acting didn't work out? Okay. And Channing t said that before uh, he ever had any plan to be an actor, he was saving up money to have a thrift store in Florida. He wanted to open a thrift store in Florida. Okay. And Scarlett asked him what it was going to be called. And he said, Chan me downs. <laughs> 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 yes. uh, and, 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 and I think he was joking, but whether he's joking or not, I was like, that is the most incredible answer in the world. That has to happen. At least that has to happen at some point. That's fantastic. All right. So in theaters this week, uh, Fly Me to the Moon. In addition, I want to put this uh, title on your radar. It's called Long Legs. This is a horror thriller. I think more thriller than horror. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've seems heard to comparisons be... to sound like a Silence of the Lambs. 100%. Yeah. And it's Micah Monroe, uh, who is uh, an FBI agent. Again, I hate to keep making the Silence of the Lambs comparison, but she's a, like a Clarice uh, yeah. Starling, and she's tracking a serial killer, a serial killer played by Nick Cage. Um, we haven't seen it, but Jake and I were both talking about this before we got on for the show. Uh, we're going out of our way this weekend to go see it because the reviews yeah. have been incredibly positive for Long Legs, 100% positive on Rotten Tomatoes. Heard nothing but rave things about it from, from it people who have seen it. Don't you just love how much care they're taking to not show Nick Cage in the promotional? Yeah. Like you have yeah. one of the biggest actors in the world and you are, I feel like doing a better job by hiding him from me. Then, I mean, they even released that clip yesterday of uh, Michael Monroe's uh, BPM and how it yeah. skyrocketed from like 70 to like 170 the first time she filmed a scene with yeah. Nick Cage. And so in that, they show that scene and you can hear the BPM go up. And when they cut to what I assume is a shot of Nick Cage, they put a black square over his face so you can't yeah. see him. Like just like like just mwah, chef's kiss to neon for saving something for the theatrical experience. See now, but I was disappointed in the final trailer because there are if you screen stop it, you know, if you stop it, freeze frame on it. Yeah, there's like three or four shots of him. You know, to at least give me an idea. Oh, really? Of what he okay, looks like. So that's all the more reason and why I need to try to heard... avoid. Yeah, because I had heard they were not going to show him yeah. at all, you know, but maybe they get to the point where, like you say, you, we have Nick Cage. We got to show yeah. Nick Cage at yeah. some point. Yeah. So. But uh, yeah, I definitely want to go out of my way and see if it's called Long Legs. And um, and we are efforting the director in case anyone yeah. from Neon is yeah. listening. We'd love hey. to get him on the on the hey. show to talk about it, especially because it also does feel like the type of movie where uh, he'll be an interesting conversation after more people have seen it. Right. Because yes. they're being so secretive leading up to the release of it. And uh, and so put long legs on your radar. Hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about it. at And length Neon, I mean, this is a very inside so. baseball. Neon normally has no problem sending us links to movies. If, if for some reason we can't make a screening for this reason or that yeah. reason, based on, if you can tell based on the summer, our schedules are all over the place. We can't even get us all together to do the show. Um, and, and so I just haven't been able to. One of, one of the screenings was at 930 at night here in Chicago. And I was like, I love you guys. I'm up at 330 in the morning. 
it's really tough. You know, I'm going to be dead if I, you know, and I just couldn't make the other screening. Um, the, the point being that the, there are no screen, no links for this, which seems like they're very protective of, of this movie in particular. They did a 930 at night, 930 at night screening. In fact, I had actually RSVP'd until I went back and looked at the, um, uh, the invite to see what theater I was supposed to go to. And when I saw it was 930, I was like, oh guys, I love you guys, but no, like it's like, <laughs> if, if only just because like, I'm incredibly excited about this movie and I'm going to be exhausted whenever I'm yeah. watching it and then be exhausted the next day. Like it's not yeah. going to do anyone any favors if I'm wiped at a, at a 930 screening. I need like 430 screenings. Dude, I have a, I have a 130 screening right after the show for Sing Sing and I am very happy about that. Yeah, that's exciting. All right, um, you guys have heard me after CinemaCon discuss the footage that we're about to get into, which is the first look that dropped earlier this week at Sir Ridley Scott, friend of friend of the show, a uh, frequent Roblin guest. Sir Ridley <laughs> Scott has a new film coming out called Gladiator 2. <laughs> it's a sequel to and follow-up. Long, it's actually long called anticipated Gladiator II. II, is that what they're going with? Yeah. Uh, and it stars Paul Mescal as we're assuming. Uh, the son of Maximus, right? Like this is, was this confirmed in the trailer? This, I don't no, know. He's Connie, Connie Nielsen. Yeah, he's he's playing Connie Nielsen's uh, son. Yeah, is and, and Lucius, Joaquin's is nephew. Name? My bad. Yeah. gotcha. Okay, so um, but it is there is a, Jake and I were talking about this. There is a factor that's kind of confusing that either we miss from the first movie or is yeah. new information, which you might. Be which is about. what? Go ahead. So no, 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 here, go ahead. here's what I was confused about. So. The trailer seems to heavily imply that he, I mean, not the, the, the character posters say that Paul Mescal is Lucius. And Lucius was the son of Connie Nielsen, who kind mm -hmm. of befriends Maximus after Maximus uh, becomes a gladiator and is the okay. nephew to uh, Joaquin Phoenix, because Connie Nielsen okay. and, and Joaquin were brother and sister. Uh, and so the trailer implies that that's who Mes Paul Mescal is. But then there, he also has a line in the trailer where he says something like, uh, I don't know where I'm from. I don't know who my parents were. And so that really confused me. I was like, okay, is he lying in that? Or is he not playing Lucius? Like, like it just, it, it went from here's, he's, he's this character that you know, but then also here's a line that conflicts with the fact that he's the character that you know. So I was very confused about, about that right. angle of, of the story. Well, so we love Ridley very much, but he also doesn't bog himself down with details. Do you think that he... That's a and massive. I mean, someone. Well, and also <laughs> Connie Nielsen's in the trailer, so like, yeah, yeah, yeah she's in it. it, yeah. it she's in the to, movie. Yeah, yeah, she's in the movie, and so it, it has to make sense in the movie. And maybe if you're, I mean, forgive me if if you're listening at home and screaming at me because I missed some detail in that trailer. I watched it twice, and I still feel like I don't get it. Um, okay. let, let me let, let me know. But I, that's that was the one thing I'm hung up on is like, wait, I don't understand what the connection is then. Yeah. So. This is a confusing thing. I wonder is if, if it's changing kind of stuff I was reading online. I believe officially in the first film, he is the son of Lucilla, but he's the uh, also the son of Lucius, who was her husband, who like she's been widowed. He died. Somehow. I don't okay. think he was in it as, at all. But I'm also reading now that it might reveal that he's actually Maximus's son and that they were a thing oh, because they didn't they know each other. That they were like romantic yeah. before, like they went and married, and that maybe Ooh. they had. Ooh. But, I, but again, I don't know if that's just the internet. That would be stuff cool. Up. But, this, but to this your is point, like one of those things, like when when Sean comes at me with like Marvel theories, and they end up being better than what they puts in the actual movie. <laughs> yeah. So, so I don't I don't know if that's something that's going to be that that would be that would be very cool. And but I do like that the movie very much doesn't try to pretend like oh because we got because we can't obviously get russell yeah. crowe back they're like we're going to pretend like maximus at this point 20 years later has become a legend which right. i feel like is really cool like the, the fact that his name is carved in the walls of the coliseum and they hang up his armor like i feel like that's that's very i, I know i love that and it, it almost i feel like it's going to make gladiator 2 feel like a companion piece to Glenn, mm -hmm. almost like a, you know, I, I'm almost kind of starting to wonder, is this going to be like a, a shining Dr. Sleep situation where we all go like, wait, why do we need a sequel to that movie? And now right. I always tell people you can't watch The Shining without watching Dr. Sleep because they are uh, they are uh, two parts of, of one story. Well, so let me read this. This is on Wikipedia, but it's a quote directly coming from a Rotten Tomatoes profile with Ridley Scott. Uh, Paul Mescal as Lucius Verus, the former heir to the Empire. Okay. According to Ridley Scott, since Lucius was last seen approximately 15 years ago, he has been living, quote, in the wilderness and has no connection with his mother who thinks he might be dead. Mm. 
He has a wife and a child, and he lives on a coastal town in Numidia, but becomes a prisoner of the Roman army and is forced to fight as a gladiator. Ooh, so that's, that's going to provide that's a great plot, and that's a great way that's, to provide the similar reveal to Maximus of like, yes, helmet, I'm I'm yeah. the guy, which is yeah. kind of cool. Oh, I, I just and and you know one of the things that I if, if anyone has ever been lucky enough to go to Rome and and, and take a, a tour of the Colosseum, which if you get the chance, I highly recommend. Um, you learn all of the wild and crazy ass things they did in the Colosseum that are far more than just gladiators fighting each other. And one of the ones that always astounded me, that always got my imagination going, is that they flooded the Colosseum and would have these naval battles. The boats. Like that's the boats. Like yeah. that's incredible and i get that like you know and it, the first time really made gladiator he only had so much time and that would have been a lot to try to introduce that um but now that he has now that he knows that we understand how all this works he seems to be showing us some of those other things that really happen and i'm so glad it looks like we're getting the naval battles um if you, it, one of the things you always hear stories about are like all these wild different animals that they used to bring in to the coliseum for these battles that we're getting a rhinoceros Rhino. Um, and, and it's not even in the trailer. Rhino. Did you see any of the footage of uh, the monkeys? I've heard that they're using monkeys. Yes. And yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That, that, that was... So, so what, I'm curious, what is monkeys. the difference between the trailer and what you saw? <clears throat> it's a lot longer um, and goes into... We saw seven minutes. Oh, like wow. A seven, like a seven-minute featurette. Yeah. That went into a lot more of Pedro Pascal's character mm. and... Who is, is he? That, I, I know, like uh, Joseph Quinn is kind of the 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 villain, or like one. Of, I guess they're like these brother emperors are going to be uh -huh. sort of the, the the Joaquin Phoenix. But is Pedro Pascal going to also kind of be a villain? I yes, think he's I think also very he, much a villain. I got from the trailer though. I got the sense that he's not quite like like he's been vilified in the eyes of Lucius, but he's mm -hmm. still because he talks about like I don't want to waste these young men on like another war, sure, you know, sure, for their sure. vanity. Like he has that yeah. line. So I'm curious if. Lucius sees it like there was it, they allude to some sort of like Lucius, I assume his family was killed or something like that the general was a part of that battle and he mm. is he says like oh what do you want and he's like you know overthrow an empire kill an emperor and he said I'll settle for a general yeah mm -hmm. I think maybe he sees him uh, to blame and he's coming after him and maybe the complex nature is Pedro Pascal's a bit more sympathetic yeah. and more of just someone who was there who was who was doing duty but doesn't agree with it and it might be that sort of complex interesting i will the, also the say that based on what we saw i know that in the trailer it makes it a little bit look like the pedro pascal um paul mescal battle might be like the end of the movie mm -hmm. but it very from what we saw if i'm guessing on the structure that might be like the middle of the movie oh interesting so like maybe they reconcile kind of thing and then that's the rest of the movie is the the rest of the movie might be more like what Denzel is plotting. Oh, interesting. Um, interesting. Because it feels like Denzel is very much pulling everybody's strings behind the scenes. That's cool. And, and speaking of Denzel, just looks like he goes for it. Like, I, I am so down. It's training day Denzel. It's yeah. training day Denzel <laughs> yeah, in yeah, yeah. the Gladiator Forum, which is 100% what I want. I also just think it looks incredible. Like The visuals look unbelievably great. It looks like epic filming, you know, it, obviously it's really firing on all cylinders. Yeah. And so uh, I, needless to say, we're all in 100 percent. Yeah, right. 100 percent on what on what Gladiator 2 is. It's it, Like you said, it feels a little bit like a Top Gun Maverick type thing or a Dr. Sleep type thing where it's like, do we really need this? And now that it's here, it's like, oh, yeah. Yeah, actually, this. this is this is enhancing the original vision. So. so, I mean, do we want to go to Rome and interview Ridley Scott for uh, for real blend? I should we say I'll, I'll say yes on behalf of Roblin. I'd be busy. Let's see. <laughs> for Ridley, I will go guy. anywhere. Yeah, for Ridley, I will go anywhere. Okay, but here's what I'll say. He is welcome on now our show anytime. It is Kevin's turn for Ridley not to answer his questions. <laughs> yeah, I've had my turn. You've had your turn. Now it's Kevin's turn. Fair enough. And in addition to Ridley, we have until almost uh, December, by the way, to wait for this movie, which feels like yeah. forever away. I mean, okay. but then again, you know, we just got the F1 trailer and that's, I do love a trailer that like makes me excited for a movie that's a year away. Mm -hmm. The F1 trailer was fantastic also. Yeah. yeah. While we're discussing trailers, Joe Kaczynski looks like he can really direct a film. Joe, <laughs> we know you're listening, Joe. My God, man. Breaking My God, news. you're good. 
Though that I do agree, Sean, you tweeted incredible. something. Um, and, I, and I don't mind saying this on the show because I think if Joe is listening that he would agree with us. And Sean, you, you're the one who tweeted this and made me realize how right you are. Hmm. Why are they not blasting from the director of Top Gun Maverick on yeah. on the poster in the trailer? I, like, I think that's and, probably coming. I think that's once you get closer, you don't want to sure. oversaturate it. It's you yeah. want people to get excited. Yeah. The summer of kind yeah. of thing. Like whenever because- I, I, I aired the, the trailer on my morning show, and we aired a clip and like people were like, oh, that looks really good. And, but the thing that, that made my anchors light up was whenever I said, it's from the director of Top Gun Maverick. And then everyone yeah. went, oh, like, I mean, because they know what that means now. Well, and if you associate that <clears throat> with the footage that you see sure. of Pitt exactly in right. the cockpit of exactly the F1 right. car, then you know, like, oh, my God, this guy put us inside a fighter yeah. jet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He's going to put us in the midst of these race cars, yeah. you know, at these tracks. PJ is an F1 nerd and watching him like he watched the trailer on his phone and then he ran downstairs to the TV to watch it on the big screen. TV there you go. And then paused it to keep pointing out to us like that's a real crew chief and this is a real driver and this is a re- that's, that's with this cool. track and that's this thing. So he is in. in, cool. in. He's in. He's in. Oh, if, you my were, God. if you were yeah. watching the season when they filmed it, it was kind of it was a big deal. Like the, the times that they were at actual races. Okay. It was the the broadcasts were, I th- I want to say that they were kind of distant. Like I I assume there were there was some separation there, but it was always like oh Brad like Brad Pitt's here and all these famous people are here because they're shooting this thing and yeah 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 I think because I think they shot they would shoot like before the race I think is how they had it scheduled so everyone was like everything was there mm-hmm. but they okay. were like running stuff I think is how they did it it's pretty fascinating okay. it'll be it'll be fun to ask him exactly how they did it on this show sure hopefully. It's cool that so they were just in Britain for the track uh, at the British track last week. And I don't think Pitt was there, but that's why they showed it. Uh, that's why they showed the trailer, because they shot most of it at that thing. Yeah. And then it's cool to see how many celebrities show up like uh, Amelia Clark was there mm-hmm. and in the garages. And then um, Mr. Bean, Ro- uh, Rowan, Rowan Atkinson, Atkinson? <laughs> was that's in the cool. garages as well. Too. <laughs> so. All generations who love F1. So, yeah, we're looking forward to covering that one as uh, as it comes to theaters. In summer of 2025, we're all still here. Uh, let's take a quick break. And on the other side, I want to discuss at length something that should be on your radar. So stick around. And we are back. All right. So coming to Netflix is the final season of Cobra Kai, um, a show that I've really enjoyed and has been kind of like a family staple for the O'Connells. Uh, Brennan really loves the show. We all get together and watch it together. And they're doing 15 episodes for the final season. Uh, and they're breaking it up into three chunks. Uh, five episodes, five episodes, five episodes. So the first five drop on July 18th. I'm putting it on everybody's radar because it's going to be coming up. The next five are in November. And then the following five are at the uh, are at next year sometime. And then it's setting up, although it has nothing to do with it. Uh, Ralph Macchio returning to the Karate Kid franchise in a movie where he and Jackie Chan are going to be together with a brand new Karate Kid. Something he I, told me would never happen, by the way. In my did last, you really? when my last interview with him, I brought up the idea of, like, hey, you know, like almost like a, a Spider Verse thing. Is there any chance that that you guys would ever bring in Jackie Chan? And he like, I haven't an interview with him where he tells me like how bad of an idea that would be. <laughs> are you kidding me? Yeah, yeah, I'll send it to you. So I think, okay. Until That's someone little, tells you that Jackie Chan's down. Until someone says, hey, Jackie Chan wants to do this. And you're like, well, then we have to do it. Well, then now I'm in. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, but wait a second. So that speaks a little bit to what I want to get to. First off, if you like Cobra Kai uh, and, and you're interested in the season, the first five episodes are terrific. It's exactly the type of thing that you want to get to. But I want to bring it up from this perspective. This whole year so far has been Eddie Murphy coming back for Beverly Hills Cop mm-hmm. 4. Uh the Cobra Kai guys, now they've been doing it for a couple of years, but it's Ralph Macchio continuing to play Daniel LaRusso. We're gearing up for Hugh Jackman to return to the role of Wolverine, who also told you, right, Jake? Who also told me that he's never <laughs> coming back to do it. <laughs> and told me to tell Ryan that he's yeah. never coming back to do it. Never coming back to do it. And I and I, I want to single out Cobra Kai. Well, we haven't seen Deadpool and Wolverine yet. We don't know yet how that plays out. But one of the things I think that Cobra Kai did that makes the fact that they are recycling this material over and over again is that they made me and our family more interested in the other characters and didn't just rely so heavily on, let's say, Axel Foley as an example for Beverly Hills Cop. Right. 
It, it's a generation of new characters who are now played by actors who we can know from other things like um, Sholo Maradona, who is in Blue Beetle and um, Peyton List, who's been in a number of different things that I'm more interested in watching this final season of Cobra Kai in the storylines that are playing out between the younger actors than I am in the Daniel and Johnny stuff when that when that bit rolls around. And that, I think, speaks to tremendously how that franchise has been able to sort of thrive, you know, and get through six seasons and still be as popular as it is. Uh, and when these franchises come back and they just, you know, lean heavily on the nostalgia, I rewatched Beverly Hills Cop 4 because I was like, I, I liked this. I didn't love it as much as everyone else seems to. It's, it's getting really positive reviews. And I rewatched it. Yeah, but so much of it is, you know, leaning on, you know, oh, this is the moment where, you know, uh, Judge Reinhold says, oh, you can never have too much firepower kind of oh yeah he said that in the second one you know it's just it's those remember berries that south park makes fun of <laughs> um and i really appreciate what cobra kai does where it you know branched out and told new stories and took it in a different direction and i think as these franchises continue to do this this is the direction that we need to go in so i, I can't watch wait to watch twisters with you when you're going to be like man this is the part where the twisters come down <sighs> just like in the last one <laughs> twisters i mean there'll definitely be a one. cow right have we seen in a cow in a trailer yet gotta be a cow be four cows four cows uh, yeah everything is is <laughs> cows. <laughs> but we haven't seen twisters yet but again isn't that i watched that trailer and to me it looks beat for beat the original movie uh, i i just well, more with more yeah but you know what's funny i guess i i, I rewatched. um uh well i guess it, it happened so we can talk about it we have we have uh 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 john debont uh, on coming on Rocked the show on Wednesday, it's available uh, now. And uh, okay. and so you know, and I hadn't. I I liked Twister quite a bit as a kid, but it's not a movie that I know like the back of my hand. So I definitely mm -hmm. um, rewatched it for that interview, and then obviously because we have Twisters um, coming up as well. And so it was, it was a fun rewatch because I really hadn't seen it in a long time. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, but I feel like it's a little, that's going to be a little bit of a different case because I don't have as much of an encyclopedic knowledge of that movie. Mm -hmm. for it to really capitalize on my nostalgia for it like you know i feel gotcha. like cobra kai and karate kid there's so much they can go back to because yeah. i i that movie i watched so much growing up um but twister not as much i don't know what about you did i mean did did, did you know i mean you you had to rewatch twister i did have to rewatch twister i still just more appreciated what twister does so well is is again made us care about the characters like mm -hmm. i i forgot how in-depth all those supporting characters were. Yeah. And really the driving notion of Twister is, can this guy get his divorce papers signed? Yeah. You know, like you legitimately care on an emotional level yeah. about these characters who happen to then encounter some of the best visual effects yeah. going at the time. Yeah. You know, well, and it, it, it was it, it ILM really, clicking. Yeah. Well, and it really reminded me of a, um, Jurassic Park in a way where, uh, it really seemed like Yonda Bond, like, you know, like th that burst of special effects technology was just coming out, you know, coming off of Jurassic Park. Yeah. But like Spielberg, it was very much a, well, I'll use it when I need it. But mm -hmm. if I don't, then bring in the wind machines. And if I don't, then bring in, you know, the, the hail machines. And if I don't, yeah. then, then, you know, when I throw a, a, uh, uh, a tanker truck full of gasoline, Give me actual fire. Give me a real explosion. You know, give me a sure. house to drive through. Like yeah, they yeah, only, yeah. they really, it's much like special effects are in that movie. They really only use it when they have to. Hundred mm percent. -hmm. And, and so I'm, I'm really curious how the new one's going to treat. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I had to look up. I saw that um, Twister, the original, the '96 one, uh, was nominated for best special effects, and I was like, what okay. the hell did it lose to? Like it's like right. those are pretty great special effects. And then when I saw what it lost to, I was like. Oh yeah, you you definitely lost that Independence he, Day. Independence Day, mm. really? Yeah, I mean yeah. that had that to be such a bummer because like in any other year, Twisters would have won. Yeah, but I mean nothing was, was beating Independence, Independence Day. Day. It was Independence no. Day, not that year. No, yeah, that was a terrific. Will Smith himself was a visual effect in that one. Yeah, <laughs> such a what an incredible announcement of a talent in that. Oh my god, black. yeah. Yeah, Just burst on the scene, and then uh, and then right. and lest we not forget, Wild Wild West. Hey, it had, had not for Wild Wild West, Will Smith would be Neo. I would tell you my <clears throat> Wild Wild West story. I I cannot believe you have a Wild Wild West story that you've never told me. <laughs> I feel like I probably have told you this I, one. Before. Try. 
I started working for a company called City Search, one okay. of my earliest uh, paid, like full time gigs where I was their entertainment reporter. And I got the assignment to write a multi page feature about Wild Wild West. Okay. Like, I didn't get to interview anybody, but I just wrote about, like, here are the characters, here are the story beats. And it got picked up and spread around the City Search network of websites, which means that the package that I wrote landed on the front page of all of these city guides okay. um, around the country. It was like first major exposure with like my name and the byline yeah. for Wild Wild West. But when it landed, um, Michelle and I were on our honeymoon. I wrote it okay. before we got married. It got distributed while we were on our honeymoon. Michelle and I were in Hawaii and I made her go to an internet cafe where you had to pay to get onto a terminal so that I could go around and, and look at copies of the thing on like Cincinnati.citysearch.com, yeah. <laughs> Chicago.citysearch.com. And then when we went to San Francisco from Hawaii as still part of our two week honeymoon, because we took a two week honeymoon. She's so lucky to have you. <laughs> it's so lucky. I made her go see Wild Wild West. You've yes, never told me that story. Really? Oh my no. god! So I wait, so that. so Wild Wild West is y'all's honeymoon movie? Yeah, we saw that on our honeymoon. Yes. So so like like whenever you want to get sexy, <laughs> do you put on the soundtrack? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, put on, yeah, yeah. Put on Will Smith followed by Bylamos. I put on uh, leather chaps <laughs> oh, black God. Only, hat. and only leather <laughs> chaps. Cap. We just got black the explicit tag. <laughs> we just got the explicit tag. Glad this is at the end of the episode. <laughs> no joke. <laughs> if All you right, made it this we, far. As we head out this week, give us your thoughts on the Gladiator 2 trailer. Are you very wow. excited for it? What do you think about Denzel? Uh, how do you feel about Sir Ridley returning to um, his most famous film? No. Gladiator mm, pro- I mean, his most famous film. Famous? Is it his most critically acclaimed film? Most acclaimed film? Like with its awards? I mean, it's it's the only one of his that won Best Picture. Blade Runner. Blade Runner is like a bit, you know, Alien. I mean, Alien alien is that? Yeah, Alien. 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 Yeah. 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 It's out there. To your point, though, Alien is kind of like a staple of filmmaking. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas Gladiator doesn't feel like a. You you know when Stanley Kubrick is calling you to uh to ask how did you do that thing yeah, yeah, yeah if you yeah, watch yeah. our interview with ridley he, uh he, he talks about the phone call i think what we're coming to is ridley scott's just really good <laughs> he, he, <laughs> i mean and here's the thing the movies of his that people sleep on are like the last duel which i don't feel Ugh. like anyone's talk- like the I, last duel is incredible i Master i Man. sing that i sing that's praises to anybody i get the chance i go it's very heavy and it's sure. like there's, it's an intense story that it's telling, and it's telling it three times. And it's like, telling it three but times. But it is exactly. made so well. It's so good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Jody Comer. I mean, but, Jody but Comer. I'm also, is uh, incredible. I'm a an apologist for House of Gucci. I I really liked House mm-hmm. of yeah. Gucci. I like Gucci. Yeah, the great one two punch. This week on Real Blind, you also learned that Stanley Kubrick loved Twister. Uh, no, yeah, he, yeah, loves yeah, yeah. he loves Speed. No, he loves Speed. No, he loves Speed. He loves Speed. Speed. Yeah, yeah, he loves it. Yeah. I, of loves all speed. of the uh, questions that we asked in the interview, that was my favorite that you yeah. asked. Aww, the, the, it was the, sh- the Shining question. Because that's such a great scene. That's the Jan de Bont interview, which is available yeah. on our channel. This is the Greg Berlanti interview. And coming up, we have some really <laughs> exciting... There's my dog again, really quick. That's my dog. interviews. Daenerys. Good night, sweet girl. All right, in the meantime, follow us on social media, at Jake's Takes at Kev McCarthy TV, at Sean underscore O'Connell, at Gabe Kovach, and the show is at Real Blend. We'll be back next week with a brand new episode. Until then, we want to go to Rome to talk to Ridley Scott. Scott. Sir, Scott. <laughs> <laughs>